Hello everyone. My name is Louise Atlanting and I'm here today to talk about life in Acadie. Uh, this is the life that my folks lived as kids growing up in the community known as Kerkut, New Brunswick. It was basically like a, an area frozen in time really. And uh, this is basically what happened. I'll, I'll put on my glasses so uh, I can actually see my camera and, and uh, see, what, see what we're doing. <laughs> okay, so um, the area is called Kerket, and it, it means the place where two rivers meet in the Mi'kmaq language. It also means, uh, like, the, 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 the area physically is shaped like a, a lobster claw, okay? And Kerket's in, in the zone between the, 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 the one claw and, and the larger claw. It's in this zone in uh, Canada, in the northern uh, peninsula of New Brunswick. So in Europe, if you go to Denmark and go east, you will see Denmark is shaped like a lobster claw. And there's a tiny island here, and that's also called Kataket. And that's uh, being made popular by shows featuring Vikings today, Kataket. And, Ketiket, and they're actually the two claws together. There's one in Europe, and then there's one in Canada. And I and the reason that's that's kind of neat uh, is because there is knowledge that Viking influences have made it to Canada, but it it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, mean that the name was Viking because there is a Mi'kmaq meaning, and it's more likely the the actual name. But it's a neat a neat link in anyway. So. Uh, uh, the area where my, my folks are from, they got there basically because they were deported uh, by Jeffrey Amherst's orders. Um, Jeffrey Amherst was a Freemason in the States. He was the one spreading Freemasonry through the military and working to basically cleanse America of all the indigenous people, the French people and the Roman Catholics to make way for English settlers. And uh, that's basically how the U.S. was formed. The deportation of New Brunswick continued going westbound until Standing Rock. Standing Rock was actually subject to Jeffrey M. Hearst's uh, genocides as well. So there was a whole swoop of that. But when the deportation took place in Acadie, uh, Acadia, um, the people were dispensed, some went to Europe. Not a lot of people know that. A lot, there were people sent back to France. There were people sent back to England. There were people who were shipped all the way along the East Coast. So you're talking Maine all the way down to Louisiana. And then they went also to the Dominican Republic. And so there's, that's the French language uh, gets in there too. So all these, these areas of disbursement. But there was also eastbound going to places like uh, Quebec, around the, 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 what do you call it, Tamaraska. There were people who went to New Brunswick. So it, it spread, like the people dispensed, right? Because we're, we're escaping a genocide here. Uh, we, were, we were kicked off the land and that's where they, they, you know, they sent us and that's where also we fled. So with that aside, I'll begin with the beginning. Uh, so we have a bunch of French Acadians who are basically Mi'kmaq, Métis and French integrated communities, these little clusters formed uh, as little tiny villages and we're being surrounded at the same time with English influences and English soldiers and, and inspectors making sure that we're not creating a fuss. So when my parents were growing up it was really 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 important to do things just so as to not tick off the British inspectors because if we ever stepped out of line it was pretty bad. Um, when my parents were small my mother remembers that there were still folks hiding in the woods from the British, afraid of another deportation-like experience. They were fearful. Um, they had British inspectors visiting homes, raiding them for books. They had British inspectors uh, suppressing the teaching of the Catholic faith to our people. Uh, that's why Louis Mayou was shot. Uh, they tried to open up an education that included the Roman Catholic faith, and there were all kinds of issues that took place in Karakat about that. And, um, but with all the politics aside, um, there were normal day-to-day -day living things too. And those are the parts I really want to talk about because they're, they're charming. And it's fascinating how the folks had a way, they had a lifestyle, and it remained virtually unchanged since the arrival into Canada. 
um, the rituals were very simple and consistent and the faith was kept the whole way throughout the process as well. Um, so the, on Mondays, on Mondays, the women would cook bread. And it wasn't just cooking one loaf, it's cooking a whole pile of loaves. And those loaves would be brought by fishermen uh, on the fishing voyages so that they could do their job and, and get some food for the family and support the families. So my grandmother uh, was um, the wife of the captain of the boat. So being a wife of the captain of the boat, you had the duty to feed the crew. So it was her job. And then she also had 18 children of her own as well. So you can imagine how, many, how much bread this woman went through. <laughs> her arms were so strong. I remember her arms. Her arms, when she shook your hand, it felt like she could squeeze every single bone in your hand to powder. She was super strong. And that lasted up till she was over 100 when she passed away, 104. Anyways, the, um, the, concept, the concept of the, uh, the bread was a ritual because she would have to make this dough. And she would pull the dough. And she did that time and time and time again. The bread had to be cooked in a wood stove. So it took a long time. It took a lot, the whole day to make all these loaves of bread. So while the stove is going, it also became laundry day. Because you could boil the water constantly on top of the stove as you're making the bread inside of it. So the laundry was done on Monday with the bread making process. And then the, the laundry back in the day was a wash tub and a scrub board to, to really agitate, remove the stains. And then they had the thing, it was like a press that they would feed the cloth through. It would go through two rolls like that to take off the excess water. And then it was on the laundry line. And that's how my grandma did her, her laundry uh, when my mom was growing up. And the laundry line was a fascinating thing because the laundry line, um, according to my mom, was basically the local newspaper. You could walk down the street and look at the laundry line and know if someone had a baby or if someone has a visitor or if someone has been feeling sick and has been going through a lot of bed sheets. You could read the news from the laundry that was on the line of the house. You could tell how many kids they had. You could tell if the husband was home. You could tell all kinds of things. So the laundry line was something that when they walked down the street, everybody was just examining these things, right? And uh, yeah, it's a pretty tight-knit community. <laughs> and um, another part of their life that they used to deal with were like the little things. Uh, like say, for example, lice. <laughs> you got kids, they have lice. How do you deal with it? Well, they dealt with it by picking it out manually. And my mom used to do that sometimes. The, she would get paid to remove the little nits off of people as a means of, you know, earning a couple of coins to get some candy. And uh, other little things were, were, were like uh, the, the families. Okay, the families were huge. My mother was the youngest of 18 children. And my dad was the second youngest of 12. And that's a rough life when you're a kid because you're basically growing up in what feels like a shopping mall. My mom explains it as being very small and, and walking through a forest of legs, just legs everywhere. And her oldest siblings were old enough to be her mom or perhaps her grandmother. So she grew up in this colony of adults and people of mixed ages all the way down to her. And so it was very difficult to find privacy. So my mom used to try to escape the group and just kind of get her own time and space. And that basically meant going in the backyard and going into the woods and hanging out out there. And uh, my mom recalls how um, when people would leave the house and she actually had the opportunity to be by herself, uh, she usually would sleep in the bed underneath the bed. <laughs> and she, she loved going underneath the bed. It was for her a cozy spot to go. She loved going under things. There was one time she went outside and she fell asleep under the smoked fish. Um, we had these racks. They're like um, pieces of wood in a, in a triangle shape like this. And the fish are drying here. The fish are drying there. And she would sleep in the middle. <laughs> so they looked everywhere for her. They couldn't find her because she's sitting there sleeping under a pile of smoked fish. Where else is there to sleep, right? Uh, but yeah, she, she, she had gotten a lot of mischief. Um, I remember one time she was saying how she went in the backyard. And she went to this 
this area where there was a pit and she started feeling really dizzy because the ground was going like this and she couldn't figure it out and then she realized she's looking at a snake's nest and the ground is chock full of gardener snakes and it freaked her out of course she bolted home but uh, in the winter time it was really fun because they had lots and lots of ice in fact there were times when they could take their skates and skate from their house all the way to the school and she tells me tales about them skating from their house all the way to the church and this skating was was very uh, satisfying it was fun right so um, back in the day uh, the church also was different because Christmas wasn't celebrated the same Christmas uh, in the days before Macy's had no Santa Claus and had none, none of this merchandising of the big presents type thing Christmas was about my grandma my grandma would make socks socks for all of her 18 kids and in the sock they would put things like an orange or some fruit or some dates because these were rare treasures but in the winter time that was the time that you celebrate and those were the treats that you would get to have an orange was exotic that was like out of this world elaborate that was a special treat and that's what the kids got for Christmas socks and fruit and uh, my grandmother um, was raised in an era where reading was forbidden um, but they did have it uh, like when I say forbidden I mean the British inspectors would raid the homes for books uh, people were not allowed to own books people were not allowed to have literacy so um, the, in order to to create trade or products the Roman Catholic Church used to send experts in uh, who would assist with teaching skills so for example they would gather all the women together and teach them how to use the loom and that's what my grandmother did uh, she had a loom that could fill a room and with that loom she made blankets and my mom still has one she has this beautiful gray blanket it's got double stripes on both sides of the blanket a little red line through as well I remember this thing I grew up with that blanket <laughs> And uh, she used to do the loom right in the living room of her house, and it just pretty much took the whole room of the house. Um, the homes that they had in Acadie were uh, store-bought homes from the Eaton catalog, if you had the money, or they were built. Uh, all the homes were hand-built. There was no um, construction firms back in the day. There was no, no big money for that. So it's like you had to learn to assemble these things yourself. And um, the house that I had, that I grew up in, my parents purchased for $1,000. And it had a hole from the attic to the basement of the house. It was in ruins. But that's what my dad and mom bought in Trenton, Ontario. And my father rebuilt the entire house. Rewired it, re-insulated it, new floors, everything. Uh, but it was funny because, um, uh, like, I mean, those skill sets, we wouldn't even think that that people could do that right they built their own house plus they still did their job they still ran their 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 basic errands and raised their kids like who has the time to build a house and then do your job at the same time right but uh, I mean that's how it was done that's how it was done um, my dad used to envy <laughs> the older kids because they had the right to ride the bike and he had a hard time getting his turn on it because he was the youngest boy of the family trying to get on this thing and uh, there are so many other older siblings who wanted to ride the family bike and when you're second youngest of 12 it's really tough so the way my dad worked around it was he got up early 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 in the morning just to have the chance to ride the bicycle through town um, the folks in the community used to uh, have a theater and back in the day uh, that that theater only played like cowboy movies and uh, they're, the only horse they had was like a plow horse, a work horse, and he wasn't fit to ride. So the, uh, my dad tried riding the cow. <laughs> that was one of the things he used to, to do, was ride the cow and pretend it's a horse. <laughs> yeah, was, those were back in the day. And the barns had chickens. People raised their own food. There was um, cow. The cow was mainly for milk, not so much for meat. Uh, they also had the um, the chickens were, were a staple for sure 
And in order to keep them warm in the winter, my grandma used to knit them little outfits, little vests where the little wings could stick out and that would keep them cozy in the winter. So all of her chickens had these really cute little lovely vests to wear. And uh, the relationship with animals was really cool. Be the Acadians always had um, the, the relationship with animal because we were Mi'kmaq, right? I mean, you eat, you hunt, you prepare. We, we hunted the moose, we hunted the deer, we hunted the pheasant, the rabbit. But we also befriended these things too. Like, I mean, there were a lot of times when the skunk would go into a, a shed or a house even sometime if you left the door open. And the way my folks dealt with it was you go in, you, you pick up the skunk, fold the tail under it right away, and you just carry it out of the shed. There's no fear factor of the spray if the tail is folded under, and that's how they handle these things. So if there's a skunk inconveniencing you, pick it up, fold the tail under, put it away. Um, one of the things uh, in terms of the foods that were local that we really ate a lot, blueberries. Oh my God. My grandfather's house had oceans and oceans of blueberries. And to this day, there's still people harvesting and selling them uh, to make a living because there's just so many. You, you can't pick them all. It's a fantastic thing, and if it can help support a family, go for it, right? We have the blueberry, we have wild strawberries, and, and in Acadia, the strawberries were a little tiny, powerful flavor, beautiful essence. Not the, those big, watery things you get in the store today. These are little, tiny wild strawberry that pack the most flavor. And I remember all the time waking up in the morning, getting a big bowl, and harvesting these things. And throughout the day, we would use the blueberry and the strawberry for like things like uh, making a pancake, making jam especially. Jam was something that we always made. Uh, I remember my grandma with making fresh loaf of bread in the morning and then we spread the homemade jam on it and we were just dying. It was so good. It was oh, absolute heaven. Blueberry jam. Oh, I love it. And the raspberry, we had a lot of the raspberry as well. And they also had one called a cloudberry. A cloudberry looks like a raspberry, except it tastes like an apricot. And those are a type of, uh, of a fruit that grew more in the marshy-like area, like a little bit more moist. But the fruit of that is fantastic, called cloudberry. You get that from the east coast of New Brunswick. Um, there were a lot of uh, medicines that, that my grandma knew because we didn't have access to doctors. So she was the local healer. So she would take things like, for example, everybody would take the spruce gum if you had sore throat, if you wanted like a cough drop type thing. The spruce gum is literally, you see the tree, you see the sap, take it off and eat it. And that, that is your, your it helps to, to soothe the throat, right? It's almost like a, a eucalyptus-like vapor coming from it as well. There were poultices that she used to make to stop infection um, of, of the skin. Uh, if there was something like uh, uh, one time her son had a, a big, almost like a boil on the neck and she used water and lye to open it up. The lye was a, a way to kind of split the skin without using a cut and by splitting the skin, it allows the pus to come out in a sanitary manner rather than introducing uh, bacteria. Infection was deadly back then, right? So you wanna, that was like the tools that they used to deal with, with uh, things like that. Um, she also was a midwife that uh, helped to deliver many of the babies. Sometimes the baby, if they were premature, required extra care. So what she did was she saved all the shoe boxes and those shoe boxes were used to hold the baby and she would line it with the blanket and put it near her stove and then run water on top of the stove to let it humidify the room so that the baby could, uh, could uh, be okay like it, it allows the moisture. And the, the, um, because of her, I can't throw a shoe box out. <laughs> My mother was obsessive about gathering shoe boxes because my grandma did that with shoe boxes. And so I grew up collecting these shoe boxes, never knowing why, until I realized that, oh, I was doing it because my mom was doing it because her mom was doing it. And it's just like this thing of shoe boxes, right? <laughs> Anyways, um, 
yeah, so she was the one that people went to for all kind of ailments, all kind of issues of, of health. Um, there was some time mustard was used on the chest in um, almost like a poultice. They they used stuff with mustard and smeared it on the chest to create that, uh, get rid of things like uh, pneumonia, bronchitis, chest infection things. There were all kinds of, uh, of uh, plants that she knew. And because I didn't speak the language growing up, uh, I I couldn't communicate with her. I, I I missed out on all those things. I was born in Ontario because uh, my dad had to leave the place to make money. Uh, he joined the Air Force and I was raised in Ontario, but I lost a lot of that medicine culture of of the of the that she had uh, with the medicinal purposes. But my mother became a nurse. My niece is a nurse. Medicine is still very much a part of our family in terms of what we do today. Um, Another thing too is uh, back in the day, the the kind of foods that they ate were really neat. Uh, they had a lot of fritu, which is like a, I guess you could say a stewish thing, made with dumpling. So, like for example, you would use a base of water, or flour, or whatever meat, and then use the 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 the, the uh, well, the flour was used as the dumpling itself. You take a dollop of that with the baking powder and you mix it with a little water and plop it in any kind of a soup and it thickens the broth and it thickens the, the dumpling itself that you have almost like a potato-like effect. Um, potatoes were huge. My grandma grew a lot of them. Uh, corn was very huge too. Corn was dried uh, for the winter. My grandma used to harvest the corn, hang it upside down to dry in the attic. There was always tons of corn shafts up there. And the corn would get really, really hard. And it was a big kind of white corn. And the corn that she had, uh, they would make hominy out of. Uh, that's the English word for it. Uh, the hominy was something that in order to reconstitute the corn, you had to soak it in water with lye. Lye was the, the chemical that softened the corn. So soak it in lye. Rinse it off really, really good because you don't eat poison. <laughs> and then eat it. Enjoy your, your stuff. Um, my grandma had a lot of people to feed. So we didn't have like dinners of roast beef or big meat dishes. That, that was way beyond our price point. That's really resource heavy. Unless you had a fresh kill. Like say, for example, you had somebody knock over a deer then you had meat for everybody, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, back in the day, meat was something that was used in pieces to fill up another bigger dish. So things like stews and soups and fritus uh, were all, uh, chowders as well, were all a mixture of things, uh, usually based with potato, uh, like you'd have pieces of potato in it, you would have onion, you'd have sage, you'd have the savory was another spice we used a lot, salt and pepper. Uh, the pork fat was a uh, basic. Pork fat was in everything. Pork fat was the grease of the day. And we would have things like cratin. Oh God, I love cratin. Cratin is, how do you explain cratin? Cratin is basically like, a, it's made of pork meat and seasoning and it has a high amount of the fat in it but for some reason it, it I crave it <laughs> a lot of people do um, everybody who, who uh, lives in the maritime or or Quebec would know what cratin is for sure it's one of those local food that everyone eats it's like a, I guess you could say it's like a pate uh, a poor version of pate <laughs> it's not like goose liver or something like that but it's definitely a tasty pate and you have that on toast and you have that with breakfast and things like that. Um, I love kata. <laughs> and then we also had, um, uh, my grandma used to do spam. <laughs> spam was handy because you didn't need a fridge for it. And refrigeration back in the day uh, was complicated because we had cold cellar. We didn't have refrigerator for a lot of it. Uh, the cold cellar was a door inside the house that you would lift up and inside of that there was a box and it had carrots, it had potato, it had all the root vegetables, it was all cellar. Uh, you had a shelf also with all your canned goods, your pickles. 
my grandmother would spend forever canning uh, everything from jam to pickles to fresh vegetables that she grew in the garden and even meat was canned, fish was canned, all these things. Whatever you could stick in the can was, was preserved. My earring just came off. <laughs> Another thing that they did a lot of was the smoked fish, of course. Uh, smoked fish and salt cod. Salt cod was very much a staple. The salt was uh, like they they cut the fish, clean it, spread it open. Then they they have the salt on both sides of these things, and that could be preserved for a long time. And so anything that you could do to preserve food was your winter supply. And so there was this always a stocking up for winter, stocking up for winter mentality, right? So the whole summer they were busy. They work like crazy in the summer to prepare food, to, to make sure that everything of the garden is going well, because that they lived off the land. There's no, there's no plan B. You have to have a good relationship with the land. Uh, my grandma used the soil um, and feed the soil. Like they did the composting before it was fashionable. And they took the ash of the stove to, uh, to compost. And, and they, they did that on all the crops except for a potato because it would make the outer skin of the potato rough. Um, composting was important. Recycling was important. They took everything of fabric and rebuilt things from it because these were resources that were not available. Uh, they didn't have money. So uh, these things you, you treasure. Like uh, if you had a, a bent nail, you would hammer it out and stick it in a jar to reuse. There was, uh, this wood was the same. You had a good piece of wood, you would take the nails out and you would store it. We all had sheds to store the materials that could be reused or refabricated. And we always rebuilt things with that wood and with those fibers. Uh, we created our own carpets. We created children's clothing from a larger article of clothing. So yeah, dad has a shirt. We make it into a kid dress, take that. Make it into patches for a quilt, take that make it into a rug with the strips of the fabric that are braided together and made into these little spirally like rugs. We, we recycled everything. A rag could also be a dishcloth. Like it, it, nothing was wasted. Um, I remember my mom saying uh, how like they, sometime if they had issue of bed bug, they would be resourceful. They had to create their own solutions, right? So what my grandma did was she had a dish and she would put kerosene in it and then put the leg of the bed in the kerosene so that as the bug goes to the leg of the bed, it'd have to go through the poison and die. And that's, they came up with solutions like that. So there was always this very creative way to address issue that whatever challenge was in their way, they had to figure it out. And it was figuring it out by engineering. It was figuring out by, by thinking through uh, how these things worked. It was quite innovative. It's fun. I mean, it's human. Everybody does it. But I mean, it, it was it was a necessity in our part because there's it's not the same as today, right? Where you go to the store, you buy whatever remedy for whatever issue. That didn't exist back in the day, right? Uh, I hope that kids uh, kids today have the opportunity to still discover and and uh, to try those concepts. I, I you know I worry sometime that. Uh, as we evolve, life gets too easy for our, our children that, that they might not uh, have those abilities in the future. So the need is there to always challenge and uh, uh, expose kids to challenges that they can figure out on their own, you know. Uh, anyway, the um, my mom was saying how um, when they were growing up, all they had was a radio. Uh, the radio was the hockey game and the news and all that stuff, right? Uh, but before the radio, the news was the people coming down the street. If there was someone coming down the street, that was news of the day. Everyone was excited to see someone from out of town. They all went to that person to find out what was happening over there. Because they, they see someone coming in, they don't know what's happening over there. There's no Wi-Fi, there's no TV, there's no uh, newspaper. So whoever came into town was considered a resource of information. And the elders were also sought all the time for information. Because as I said, the... Because there were so many challenges and there were so few answers without media around or without libraries or the ability to read, they had to resort to the elders to guide us. And the elders had a very, very high position in society. They were valued and they were always, uh, people always went to them for relationship issues, for how do I take care of my baby, to how do I deal with this, this illness. To, elders were gold. Elders were our internet. 
They were the ones who knew everything if you asked them. They were our Google. And uh, the sad part is, as the radio came, everyone started putting more emphasis on the radio as being that factor. And then as TV came, it got even worse. And then the elders found they weren't needed anymore. They became lonely. They became isolated. And my mother remembers that that is actually the factor that started people to drink. When they felt disconnected, when they felt useless, when they felt like they were ostracized away from other people, they drank. And that was an interesting thing. Because you wonder if improving social cohesion and inclusion could cure those kind of societal ills. You know, imagine if we reconnected with our elders. Imagine if we included them in our lives again the kind of society we could have and the kind of remedies it can provide for people of all ages. Eh? Like we can't, we can't throw people away. Our society is a disposable one today, but back then it wasn't. The value system, you know, we, we got to get back to cherishing everybody and their skill set.